Welcome everyone. Um, my name is uh, Malcolm Bell. I'm the vice chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Mayo Clinic at Rochester. And today I'm, I'm delighted to have as uh, a guest in our uh, series of interview with the experts, uh, Dr. Patricia uh, Pelliker. Uh, Dr. Pelliker is the former uh, director of our echocardiography uh, lab and uh, subsequently uh, chair of the division of cardiovascular ultrasound. She's also past president of the uh, American Society for Echocardiography. And today we are here to talk about uh, stress echocardiography. So uh, welcome, Patty. Thank you, Malcolm. Good to be here to visit with you. Yeah, you know, this brings back uh, a lot of memories. I remember when stress echocardiography was first being discussed and introduced here um, now, probably, you know, three decades or so ago. And so uh, maybe this is a, a timely point to maybe just have you uh, summarize, you know, how did this get its origins and, and what were the validation studies that, you know, we heard about so much uh, all those years ago? Yes, that's a great question. So it was when I was completing my fellowship that I was charged with the task of getting stress echo started at Mayo Clinic. Um, so we purchased the equipment and trained the staff and um, created a database. And stress echo was relatively new at that time point. Um, it was being practiced at some centers, but not widely and really hadn't been fully validated. The studies out there were small studies in patients who had had coronary angiography, but only a subset of patients who have a stress test go on to have coronary angiography. And so we thought it would be helpful to look at what happened to entire consecutive series of patients who had the test. We applied stress echo for detection and risk stratification of coronary artery disease and looked at consecutive patients who had the test ordered clinically um, and, and found its prognostic utility to be invalidated it in men and women, the elderly, and diabetics, um, and all sorts of subgroups of patients. Then the practice has just continued to grow. And I think that really attests to the fact that our clinicians find the information provided by stress echocardiography to be clinically useful in patient care. So, you know, this is a long time ago now, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, you were there at the very beginning, and I remember the, uh, the important work that you and, and many of your colleagues uh, performed. Accuracy has probably uh, you know, changed significantly. And maybe you can just uh, remind us, you know, for a stress echocardiogram today, let's say you're just looking for coronary artery disease, uh, what the expected accuracy of such a test would be uh, today. The accuracy of stress echocardiography is similar to the accuracy of another stress imaging test, such as stress nuclear perfusion and in side-by-side -side tests, um, assessments in various populations, they have performed comparably. And the ACC appropriate use criteria consider them comparable for assessment of um, known or suspected coronary artery disease in patients presenting with cardiac symptoms. But of course, the actual accuracy depends on the population, the pretest probability of disease in the population that is studied. And so if you're applying testing to a very low risk population, you'll get one accuracy as opposed to studying them in patients with a high probability of coronary disease. We generally feel that the sensitivity and specificity are around nine, 85 to 90% um, in patients with um, suspected coronary disease. And so we'll often counsel patients that um, we could miss something in about one in 10 patients, or that in about one in 10, we might have a false positive test. Okay. So and I guess the other thing too, which we've uh, seen uh, a lot more in recent years has been the use of contrast uh, during these uh, studies. Uh, maybe just tell us uh, how much that has helped to improve um, you know, the, uh, the performance of the test and how often it's used? Yes. So the echo image enhancing agents have been demonstrated to be safe and to increase our ability to see endocardial borders, even in patients who would otherwise 
have difficult echocardiographic images. This includes patients with large body habitus and patients with lung disease. So now the feasibility of doing a stress echo and getting diagnostic quality images is about 99%. Um, we use the contrast for about um, half of the patients undergoing dobutamine stress echocardiography and for about a quarter of those undergoing exercise echocardiography. Patients who are unable to complete an exercise test, that is the dobutamine stress patients, tend to be larger and have more comorbidities, and that's why the contrast is needed more frequently in those patients. Patty, uh, I think it was 2016, you were one of the primary uh, authors of the recommendations for uh, clinical stress echocardiography uh, and this was you know, published by the, uh, the European uh, group, as well as the uh, American Society for Echocardiography. Do you want to maybe just uh, highlight uh, some of those indications? I mean, you've already touched on coronary artery disease. I don't know if you want to add anything further, but, um, but then after that, you know, what are the, the non-coronary artery disease uh, indications and um, utility of, of stress echocardiography? That's an excellent point, Malcolm. I think the true beauty of stress echocardiography is its enormous versatility. And that is, it can be applied to all forms, almost all forms of heart disease. And this is detailed in the um, ASC, EACVI guidelines. Um, but it can be applied to patients presenting with symptoms of exertional dyspnea, and we can assess diastolic function and pulmonary hypertension. At the same time, we do a stress echo looking for ischemic wall motion abnormalities. We can also find other causes of chest pain. We have detected um, valvular disease that was not recognized clinically, and we've detected um, aortic dissections um, we do some screening assessment of the heart and, and these images prior to doing the stress test, and that allows us to uncover other forms of heart disease. Stress echo is also indicated in patients with hypertrophic uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy, that is symptomatic patients in whom resting measurements and valsalva do not demonstrate the gradient, the maximum instantaneous gradient of 50 millimeters mercury or more. So some of those patients will be subjected to an exercise test. Um, we can also use stress echo to differentiate forms of cardiomyopathy, the ischemic from non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, and it's being applied to congenital heart disease as well for predicting prognosis. We can assess the right ventricular response in patients with certain types of congenital heart disease. In patients with valvular heart disease, stress echo also often provides important information regarding the patient's risk and whether it is time to intervene surgically. So besides that though, our stress echo just includes assessment of, it's kind of a screening exam for anyone who hasn't had a recent transthoracic echocardiogram. So we can recognize left ventricular hypertrophy, um, if there's a pericardial effusion, um, a quick look at the valves, all of that is possible with the test. And I think that is one of the reasons the test has become so popular with our referring physicians. Okay. You know, and in fact, uh, you, you talked about, you know, looking at diastolic function, particularly in people who have, uh, you know, dyspnea or may not have chest pain. And, and I personally have found that very, very useful, particularly when you combine that, you know, with, you know, measurement of uh, O2 consumption and, and getting all those other parameters and then feeding that into the, to the findings of uh, echocardiography. Um, just to finish, though, so, uh, Patty, uh, what do you see as the future directions uh, for, for stress echocardiography? I mean, it seems as though it's uh, reached a... Um, you know, a stage now that, uh, you know, it performs very well, everyone's very comfortable using it, but, you know, what, what are we going to see in the next five years or so? And, and maybe as you um, answered that, maybe, you know, just a question of looking at myocardial perfusion. I mean, there's been some uh, um, you know, work you know, from here as well, uh, looking actually at myocardial perfusion as part of uh, stress uh, imaging. So um, maybe just uh, help our listeners understand uh, and, and get a, uh, sort of a view of what's, what's around the corner. Yes, yeah, that's 
the, the future it continues to be exciting for stress echocardiography. Although it is a mature test, there are newer methods that are coming along that are going to help us make it even better and to reduce inter-observer variability in its interpretation. Um, and perfusion imaging continues to advance. We are using it uh, clinically in some of our pharmacologic stress tests where contrast is clinically needed. We're also using strain deformation imaging applied to um, the ventricles and also the atria. But I think the most exciting thing is the application of artificial intelligence to interpretation of stress echo. And that is, there's a lot of work that has already been done in that space. And that is going to further enhance the reproducibility and standardization of stress echocardiography and even further increase its applicability throughout the world. When you talk about artificial intelligence, uh, does that also include you know, um, guidance of where to put the probe uh, in terms of what you're looking at during the stress testing? There, there, is, um, there are methods of providing guidance to where to put the probe, but I think those are probably best for um, transthoracic imaging that is not stress because stress really does require technical expertise to put the probe in the right place very quickly um, to get the images at peak stress. Um, but it's not to be said that it might not be in the future. The next advances will be in machine learning of the limited echocardiographic images and how we use those to detect ischemic heart disease and other disease. You know, one last question, Patty, uh, and, and I think this is a, you know, a, a practical question. We, we've all witnessed sort of the, um, uh, the uptake of uh, using CTA uh, for uh, you know, diagnosing you know, coronary artery disease non-invasively. Uh, you know, that uh, technique you know, has matured a lot over recent years, and, and as you know, it, it's being used more and more. And so how do you see that fitting in with uh, stress echocardiography, uh, particularly in the coronary artery disease you know, population? Uh, does that mean we're going to see you know, fewer stress echocardiograms done or more? What, what, what's your take on that? CTA definitely does have a role, particularly for um, low-risk patients or healthy patients um, that, or younger patients that do not have um, calcification of their coronaries or prior stents. Those patients with calcification and stents can be difficult to assess with CTA. Um, but sometimes even when CTA suggests a problem, you still need the functional test to understand where it is and its clinical significance. I, I really think that CTA and stress testing are complementary as we look at anatomy and functional significance of disease. Yeah, I think that's a really important uh, point. And, and maybe we'll end there because I think that, you know, the functional you know, capacity of our patients is probably, you know, still the most important prognostic uh, indicator. And, and it's hard to uh, prognosticate when, when you don't have that information. So that's a very good point that you've made there. Well, Patty, I'd like to thank you so much uh, for, for joining us uh, today. I think uh, you've, um, as I said at the beginning, you, you've been there from the very beginning of uh, stress echo echocardiography. I can't think of uh, anyone better to, uh, to give us uh, um, these viewpoints on how it's matured and, and where it's going uh, in the future. So thank you so much. Thanks, Malcolm.